Pocatello and Pocatello Community Media welcomes you to this forum featuring the candidates running for mayor of Pocatello. The League of Women Voters is a nonpartisan organization which seeks to promote the informed and active participation of citizens in government. The League neither supports nor opposes candidates for office at any level. Instead, it works to provide educational opportunities to the voting public to ensure a well-informed electorate. The League is always open to new members, both men and women. There are membership forms available should you be interested. There is also a table over here to my right that has um, can printed candidate information on it, as well as information regarding the bond proposal for Bannock County Jail Facility Addition and the Behavioral Health Care Center. League of Women Voters is on Facebook. Anyone is welcome to comment on our posts, but please be aware that all posts must be relevant to League positions and will be monitored by our Facebook administrators. Tonight and tomorrow's forum, tomorrow night we will have a forum for the City Council candidates. Both of these forums are being streamed live on Pocatello Community Media, cable channel 56 and online at pocatello.us slash vs slash streaming. Tomorrow, this forum will be available on YouTube at Pocatello Community Media. Except for authorized news organization, no other videos are allowed. So please not only turn off your phones to avoid interrupting noise, but do not video any part of this forum. Our National League of Women Voters procedures require that we inform you that no part of our League of Women Voters of Pocatello sponsored video production may be used in advertising or in any other way to promote a candidate or issue, nor can it be used in any format other than in its entirety. The Pocatello League is grateful to the City of Pocatello for providing this meeting space, and also we are extremely grateful to the Pocatello Community Media who has been televising our forums and public meetings for many years. So I would like to in introduce our moderator for this evening, Margaret Gagno, who will introduce our panel and describe the format for tonight's forum. Thank you. Thank you, and we, we did want to take just one moment to um, acknowledge our our friends and families and neighbors down in Las Vegas um, it, with a, a quick moment of silence. Oh that heavy on our hearts. Um, we'll start to get to know the candidates for the Pocatel mayoral race. And in the next hour and a half, you will get to know them. Um, we are hoping with a pretty broad array of questions, we already have quite a, a few, so we are not delaying at all. They will have two minutes to start to introduce themselves, their qualifications, their goals for their time in office. And we will quickly after that transition, we switch who goes first each time. We'll go straight down alpha so that you guys are prepared and, and not caught um, unaware. We have uh, questions the rest of the time. Those questions, each candidate receives one minute to respond. And um, if they don't care to use the full minute, we move to the next candidate. We will reserve 30 seconds for any rebuttals, but we strongly request that you not use rebuttal time unless something brand new is coming up where you feel like you will be irreparably harmed without um, responding in that segment. We have questions that were submitted via email. If you go to the um, League of Women Voters Facebook page, there's an email address there. You can submit questions for tomorrow and next week's candidate forums as, as well. And none of those are provide, provided to the candidates in advance. So none of the candidates have seen any of the questions tonight. In addition to that, we have quite a number of questions coming in from the audience. And we have volunteers circulating. Just raise your hand if you need a card, a pen, if you're ready to turn one in. We have quite a bit of duplication already among questions, so we will rewrite a question if it's not legible or if we have duplication or if it's directed to just one candidate, we need to redirect it to the full field. Um, with that, we will go ahead and get started, and at the very end, everyone will have a minute to conclude. If you would like to start, 
Tammy Bartlett. All right, wow, we packed the house tonight. <laughs> Welcome to the forum. My name is Tammy Bartlett. I am the executive director for Foster Grandparents, an organization where seniors 55 and over volunteer in the schools and other educational facilities, and they work with disadvantaged children to bring them up to their full potential. Uh, currently, we have uh, grandparents in 16 counties, so I oversee all of that. Uh, additionally, I write grant proposals for nonprofits, businesses, and individuals. I write grants on a local, national, and international level. The funders that I work with are the federal government, private foundations, and corporations. <coughs> Prior to that, I was a research analyst for the Department of Defense and the um, Army Corps of Engineers. I've lived here for 30 years. I, I went to school here. I became a teacher here. I taught for five years before I became the children's and young adult librarian at the Marshall Public Library. <clears throat> While I was there, I collaborated with lots of businesses and organizations to develop programs for, for, um, for teens, kids, and adults. I volunteer at, in my community a lot. Um, I've been in Leadership Pocatello. I volunteered at the Pocatello Police Department, the Animal Shelter. Um, I'm involved in Zonta International, uh, Families in Crisis, and I sit on the board for the Bennett County uh, Historical Society. My goals are um, workforce retention through education, responsible city growth and historic preservation, job diversity, and funding for city departments. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Lyle? Thank you very much. First of all, thank you to the League of Women's Voters for uh, sponsoring this forum. I uh, appreciate all the work that they put into this, and it's absolutely an incredible uh, act of kindness and uh, trying to get the word out to the community. So thank you very much for, for all the League that does for us. I would also like to thank um, the League for taking a moment of silence for our friends, our family, and the people in uh, Las Vegas on that uh, horrific event. That's a, it's, it was a horrible uh, event to wake up to this morning and to hear that news. And, and so I appreciate them uh, being cognizant of that. So thank you very much for that. You know, we have uh, come a long ways over the last eight years, and I've been really excited about the things that we've seen and the things that we've done as a city. Uh, eight years ago, the unemployment rate was extremely high. It was at 10%. Today, unemployment's at 2.3% in Pocatello. It's incredible. Also, we've got, um, we had a wage that was below uh, the, below acceptable, uh, an hour average wage that was below acceptable range here in the state of Idaho. And we were able to, we've been able to turn that around. We've been able to, in the last eight years, make that wage, uh, almost double that wage uh, on an aver average hourly wage. And so that in itself has been uh, incredible. As I think about the businesses and the people that we've been able to court to come to Pocatello, they're great, great businesses. I, I look at Amy's Kitchen. We had a company that we lost there with uh, Heinz. Amy's Kitchen's turned around and uh, we've doubled the employment there. We've increased the wages. We've given them better benefits, the employees better benefits and stuff. And I could go on and on and I've got 15 seconds left and two minutes isn't enough to tell you everything. So hopefully there are a number of questions that we can answer, but things are going very good in Pocatello. I'm really excited about our future. Thank you. That was right on. Mr. Idaho Mark? Well, I have a different view of Pocatello, probably because maybe I ride a bike. Maybe I go in alleys that uh, people don't go in as often. Maybe just places and people I meet with in different circles, possibly. I, I work with people with cancer. I work with issues regarding cancer. I work with schools when I'm allowed to um, because I am an educator and have worked in this community as an educator. Of course, I have most of you who do know anything about me. I'm here to save lives, save the university, save Pocatello, and lots of other areas in eastern Idaho. As I, if I might have met me in the parade, it was very simple. I'm here to save the, the city and save the university and save the university from the city. And the city and the university needs to become a leader because to thrive here rather than the money they've lost and they'll continue to lose more. It's because the world knows what's going on here. And it's not a pretty picture. 
I myself am a videographer. I make documentaries. I'm looking forward to do more of that here and do it on a grand scale because the world wants to know simply why we are sending our children to uranium contaminated schools. Illegal to do it. People are breaking the law to do it. And I'm here to put an end to it and make this a prosperous community with prosperity. Because I represent in my campaign the new prosperity, the new beginning for Pocatello. Jobs for everybody because the billions of dollars that are available for cleanup in Pocatello, when you have your first cup, clean up Pocatello, C-U-P. I believe you remind of that. Every, every level of opportunity for jobs here, from the university down to high level jobs, because it's a lot of work cleaning up a community, because I worked up in northern Idaho on some of those issues up there. They've spent a billion dollars in cleanup. And it's known for cleanup. We're known for cover up. Thank you. You're welcome. Mr. Horst? I'd like to say thank you for everyone showing up. I uh, appreciate you guys taking the time to come and see us. Uh, I think that one of the things people need to know about me uh, is where I came from and why I'm here. Um, I started in the Air Force, uh, became a fire team leader overseas on many deployments that I was over there. I uh, began my leadership training at that uh, level. As I've come to love Idaho, I moved over to this side of the state with a friend of mine uh, when we were both hired on by the city, and I've been here for 20 years. I've moved up through the ranks uh, during the time that I've spent here. Uh, during that time, I've seen the city grow, and I've seen the city stop growing. Uh, over the last eight years, six of the eight years that I've lived, or that we've been dealing with taxes, they've gone up. Uh, we see more and more people living double jobs to make ends meet, uh, and we've really become a service-oriented um, city. A lot of people in this town are struggling to make ends meet. I see it every day. Um, what we're lacking truly in this city is, is leadership. Uh, I do not want to be a politician, never wanted to be a politician. I want to lead the city, I want to be able to create jobs, I want to lower our tax rate, and I want to make an opportunity for everyone to be able to survive and thrive in our city. We're losing people every day, our growth rate has stagnated, uh, we're not pulling in the businesses and the people that we need to, and we're living day to day. People are living paycheck to paycheck, and we need someone that's willing to step up, make the tough choices that we have to make in the city. We have to streamline our costs, streamline our expenses, and we need to be able to reduce the levy rate so people will want to come here, people will want to stay here, and we can get good paying jobs for people to survive on. Thank you. Ms. Hudson? Hi, I'm Jamie Hudson. I was born and raised here. I went to Pokey High School, and I'm proud to be a Pocatellian. The reason why I am running is because when I came back here, I could see that people are really out there working two jobs just to survive. I have 20 years of experience working with the homeless, working with the Federal Bureau of Prisons, working with police officers. I also have worked with the women of domestic violence. I have the experience, I see, I know what the needs are and how to create safe havens for them. We need that in our community. We need more social services. We need more mental health. We need more just homeless services and food banks around here because people are hurting. I'm running because I'm a voice of the people from the person standing on the street with the street corner sign to those who live on the hill. We need representative that knows how they, are, how they feel when you walk in their shoes. So that's why I'm running and I'm just thankful I have, a mas I have two masters from Chapman University. I have one in organizational leadership and one in human resources. I also just have a caring heart for people. Just the people being a representative, the face of Pocatello is representing all the citizens here, and that's why I'm running. Thank you. Mr. Laubumi. Thank you for the League of Women Voters to invite me over here. Pocatello is my adapted home. After many years during which I raised a family here, I have two daughters, pursue a good career, and open several local business in town here. At the present time, I own Sam Gun Shop and Indoor Rain over North Main. And uh, <coughs> I grow up this city. 
because of uh, the city of Poktol having given me a great deal, and now I want to give something back. With my background as engineering, work at the INL as a project engineer, retire as a senior engineer. And uh, I believe I, I have an ideal suit to the uh, task to being a mayor as a pork teller. I look forward to the future. We, free, great, we have a great, uh, great challenge in the balancing growth while preserving those things. We make this city such as a special place. This issue will require proactive individual, which is to demonstrate problem solving ability, and I am that person. Thank you. Thank you, thank you all. The first question will go to Mayor Blad. This is a question that came through Facebook. Given the recent ruling from the Idaho State Supreme Court regarding the water and sewer fees that the city may be required to refund, what measures would you take to avoid the situation in the future, and how would you find the revenue to refund the money if need be? Thank you uh, very much. For, so first of all, how would I avoid this? For, I wouldn't do it to start with. That's what I wouldn't do. I would have followed the direction from the state attorney general and said, do not do that when they did it back in 2006, in 2005, 2006. That decision was made. This is a decision that we get to, we have inherited, and we are going to have to find a way to fix it. Uh, I'm not uh, really sure how to answer that and how we're going to pay for it because we don't know what the fix is. Uh, the, ru the, the rumor out there is there's a $30 million uh, deficit. It could be as uh, it could be 30 million. It could be a couple million. I'm not, we, we just don't know. We've got to wait and see what the the district court says. The Supreme Court has remanded it back to the district court, so we'll see. And I anticipate we won't see what that uh, issue really is for another year or two. And so it'll be a matter of being fiscally responsible and making sure that we keep that in mind as we move forward in budget. Thank you. Mr. Carter? Well, it's kind of a history of things here in this community because when the money is available, whether you choose to do anything with it, um, we got this thing we got to pay back from something that was done before, and it's just like the uranium materials. It's here. When are you going to deal with it? Even when the money is there for you to deal with it, when are you going to deal with things? Water, water quality, sewer. I mean, we've got problems. I don't drink the water here. I don't know how many of you do. It's not a healthy water system to drink from. You know, we got a great source of the water, even though it's very small, but we need to regulate it better. We need to maintain it better. And of course, going down to debts and things that have happened in the past, again, that's fiscal responsibility that I haven't seen in this community for many years. And so, sure, we don't want to repeat it, and how should we deal with it? Of course, we're looking at money sources. And again, I'm dealing with things that bring jobs and money to this community. Thank you. Mr. Horst? When this court case came out uh, about four years ago with the ruling from the district judge, he made the mention that the city had overcharged about $4 million. Uh, during that time, that court, got ch or that court case got challenged uh, up above, and we've been sitting waiting to see what that result was going to be. During that time, we've done nothing for planning for it. Uh, we haven't set aside any money. We haven't made any other arrangements to try and pay for that ahead of time. We haven't stored any of the monies that we've actually had a little bit of extra every year. Uh, that's what I would have done. I would have been setting aside money, uh, saving it, and ultimately, if the court case would have turned in our favor, we could have went out and paved roads. We could have built a fire station. We could have built a training station. We could have done something else with that money at that time, but we would have been planning so that it wouldn't have been such a great impact in one year. Ultimately, unless we're willing to close down some of the TIF districts uh, and retire them early and pay them off early, I don't know where the city is going to get the money from. Uh, we may be stuck with a bond. Thank you, Ms. Hudson. This problem just didn't happen overnight because uh, I only know about, like most citizens, of what it said in the paper, but it wasn't something that just happened overnight. So your elected officials obviously knew that it was going on. 
So the only way I can see we, we can, we'd have to look at the budget, trim the budget where we can, and pay people back their money. It's not right to take money from people that are hardworking, especially a community where most of the people are elderly in our community. It's just not right and they need to be paid back. If the district court finds that ruling, it's only just to pay them back. Thank you. Mr. Lebowin. Well, I have been read about the court case here, you know. I have some roughly idea, Chad is right, you know. Uh, we hope we can find some resource to pay back. I've been thinking about, we're gonna look at the equity of the city, what do we have? We might have to uh, sell some of our equity here if I be a mayor to pay off without raising the tax or another revenue from another you know, source. I'm really think if I be a mayor, I look into it real close. I don't like to raise in the tax. We pay more tax right now than anybody else in the state of Idaho. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Bartlett? I too would have followed the recommendation and not done that. Um, I believe that the finance department, we have a very good finance department, and I think they will figure that out. Um, I do know that they have saved some money for that. Uh, I, again, we won't know for a while what's going to happen with that, so I think there's time to figure it out. Thank you. Any rebuttals? Mm -hmm. Okay. We will move to question two. Oh, I was expecting rebuttals. What do you envision, Mr. Cartel, first to you, uh, for the future of our historic old town in terms of the use of vacant buildings, maintaining the Center Street underpass, and police presence, and what is your timeline? Timeline, I work constantly with what I would consider the artistic district. It's a label we put on it years ago when I was chairperson of the Arts Council. It's what we wanted it to be, uh, an area that utilizes an avenue, which a lot of places do around the country, making it more artistic. Now, our architecture in the old town is artistic too. That's why we treasure it. It's not only historical, but it's unique. And trying to preserve that, that those buildings and those places is important. A lot of people have mentioned, says, you know, well, there's nobody in the storefronts. Yes, but they are being used more. There are people being used them because they sell things the internet. They are not necessarily can afford or want to afford to try to have a storefront. Things are changing in that way. And so who's gonna use the storefront thing, the, the avenue? Um, yeah, that's gonna take a unique kind of thing, which we're, we're evolving, we're evolving as a community. If we don't make that a place, like when we block off the streets a little, when we have festivals, when we have things Thank that people can go. Thank oh, you. Sorry. Mr. Horst? Now I know where you are. <laughs> the Old Town District, uh, is a historic district for us. It's where we started our roots. Uh, the problem is, is it's falling apart. Um, the historic district, some of the things that the city do, we put up so much red tape for allow the people to be able to refurbish, rebuild, and renew the, that area. One of the things that we have to do down there is to get the businesses to want to come back down there. Uh, one of my worries with the Northgate expansion is that it's going to make the historic old town a ghost town. Uh, most people are going to want to move up to that new subdivision, that new area. Uh, we haven't really done a whole lot to keep them down there. Uh, some of the tax incentives, some of the things that we used to have, um, we've gotten rid of. We have to figure out a way to make it an area that people want to be, and we're not doing that right now. One of the problems that you see is every building is crumbling, and I've talked to several of the business owners, and they want to rebuild them, but it's just so expensive for them to do it, and unless we cut some of that red tape to allow them to do it, I don't know that they're gonna be able to get the people in there. Thank you. Ms. Hudson? Well, uh, my friend works in Old Town, and the most problem that they have down there is rebuilding it, remodeling it and having to go through a lot of red tape. So somehow, you gotta be able to com compromise with businesses so they can go in there. I'd like to see Pokey restored. That is a historical school. It is falling apart. We should be concerned about our kids going there. It should be remodeled. And so those buildings down there, they all need to be remodeled, but keep the face value of them. You can be remodeled and keep the face value of them. So it still looks the same. 
Thank you. Mr. Lavoumi? Well, uh, I've been walking at uh, Old Town, uh, not uh, every business uh, door over there, in, almost at, uh, every weekend when I have a chance. I have been passing out this card here, you know, to the people in the Old Town and see what they want to do and talk to some of the business over there. They say the Old Town have a lot of rules and regulations. They cannot do anything else to restore because of the city requires so much to have a lot of problems uh, with fighting the material to make it look like the old tower, especially the old brick, have to be matched exactly. Now, for my concern, old tower should to have some uh, less, uh, you know, uh, and bring some uh, teenager or younger generation you know, store over there instead of, you know, everything we see is, uh, you know, uh, old, uh, what they call. Thank you. Ms. Bartlett? <coughs> yes, it is expensive to refurbish those old buildings, and that's because you are, you do have to follow, there's guidelines you have to follow to protect those buildings. You have to do it that way. Um, but there are some innovative programs out there. I've looked at them. I've followed some towns that are similar to ours, and they've been able to revitalize their old town that way. Um, some of them are grants, but some of them are just programs that we can do. Thank you. Mayor Glenn? Well, it was mentioned the Northgate project, and that's a project that's going to be a, it's going to change the face of uh, Pocatello. And uh, we too have been afraid and, and worried about Old Town and what uh, is going to happen down there. And so we've been actively working to create a small business incubator space in Old Town where we'll be able to take people, teach them how to do business, teach them about business. In, uh, get them interested and to stay down in Old Town for their for their uh, their shops and for their building buildings. Old Town isn't drying up. It might be hard to believe, but they've got an occupancy rate of over 90% in those buildings there. It seems like when somebody moves out of those buildings, there's three or four people on a waiting list to, to purchase those. And so it's not dry, not drying up. We're in really good shape in Old Town, and we're going to make it bigger and better, and it's going to continue to, to improve. There are some regulations that we're working with. And uh, it's a historic... Uh, Thank One minute. You. Any, any rebuttal? I, I have a little. Sure. You better learn your math, Brian, because I'm down there all the time. And like I said, there are people who are utilizing space, but there you can just look. There's floors after floor of no occupancy, glass falling out because they having trouble getting anybody on the ground floor, never mind the whole building. And so there's a lot of issues. People are struggling down there. They need, you know, we, they need like, businesses that relate to something that where they're at. That's why the coffee houses, uh, some businesses like uh, offices are down there, even counseling, things like that. And those are the types of things you can grow and expand on. The artistic element, as I always saw, often call it, the historic and artistic portion. Any other additional? Well, I'd like to uh, say a little bit about the old town. I came here in 1969. I used to enjoy a lot. You know, we used to have a Manic Hotel, we used to have a Shield Theater. I went to ISU and we really enjoying it. I like to see Old Town getting better than they are right now. It's very, very difficult to remodel the Old Town. Thank you. Any additional? I have a comment. If uh, there is going to be an incubator establishment down there, then where is the information to the public? because those buildings are very empty. I have never seen nothing about no incubator or trying to build that down there. That's all I have to say about that. Thank you. Ms. Bartlett, additional? The only thing I know is that the, you know, where the youth ranch used to be, I mean, that's still empty. That's been empty now for a couple of years. So I will. Uh, I would just like to mention. I didn't get an opportunity to mention anything about about our police department and our police presence in in Old Town. We've got an incredible police department that does incredible work. It's amazing the things that they prevent from happening because they're down there and they're visible. 
uh, we we've also you don't catch everything but they they do a wonderful job and I've, I've got to thank them for that and uh, for the, the the information speak to the director of Old Town she'll tell you that the occupancy rate it's just over 90 percent thank you this will go first then to Mr. Horst and the question is what is your position on the Bannock County Jail Bond and Behavioral Health Crisis Center I spend a lot of time at the jail, unfortunately. Um, and I can tell you that it is unbelievably overcrowded. Uh, the county and the city are basically sitting on a litigation time bomb if we don't do something out there. Uh, the crisis center is something that should have been added to the first bond when it went out. Uh, I think that the jail expansion is something that we're gonna need in this town. Uh, we do not have the bed space to take care of the amount of inmates that we have. I know a lot of people say that the inmates, a lot of them are there for petty crimes. I, I take a lot of people out there. I know what they're there for, um, and that bed space is needed. The crisis center is going to be a huge help to the city, and we absolutely need to support this bond. Uh, not, not alone for the jail, but we need to get both the crisis center and the jail together. Thank you. Ms. Hudson? Well, I've looked at the, the crisis center. I believe that it's a good plan. It's a strong plan because it will provide transitional housing and it will help the homeless rate that we have here. It will provide people's food, clothing, and shelter needs. It will help get more places for the inmates, but not just for the inmates, but to help them get the help that they need for mental health help them get on their feet and get stabilized before returning to the community. So it is a really good, strong plan. Thank you. Mr. Labarini? Well, I agree with Chad, you know, we, but we have to study a little bit, you know, have a, a study how we're going to take the money out from the bond. You know, I don't want to we issue the bond and suddenly use for something else. I see that happen many times. And then plus another thing, we pay a lot of tax and everything. We should to looking another way how to get uh, that expansion of the jail in Bennett County. And I, I hate to say that because of right now we pay up to the north. We have a highest tax. Uh, this city have a highest tax in the state of Idaho. I've been studying, I can show you a bit. No. If you guys like the bond, I don't have any objection for it, but I want to study further. Thank you. Ms. Bartlett? Oh. We do need the... Excuse oh. me. Oh, I can't do that. No permit. Sorry. Excuse us for that. She started that at the beginning. Okay. Hi. Ms. Bartlett. <laughs> we could start the... It's a color. <laughs> Okay, we do we do need the jail. Uh, we do need to pass it. I know we don't want more taxes, but we do need to pass that because it's actually costing us money. We're paying for people to be housed in other areas, and it would save us money if we actually had the jail. I'm hoping that the jail is going to be, that they're planning the jail for the future since we have the Northgate ex extension, and they're not just planning it for right now for what we need right now. So hopefully that's moving forward. Um, as far as the crisis center, we need that too because uh, a lot of the people that are in the jail actually should be in the crisis center. However, there are different ways to fund the crisis center. Um, there's actually grants for the crisis center. I don't think we need to be taxed on that. I don't even think we need to do that. Thank you. Mayor Blatt? Thank you. First of all, I just want to clarify, uh, Mr. Horst down there is taking people to jail. He's not the one spending the night in jail. I want to clarify that for him, so you're welcome. Uh, the jail bond is extremely important to our community. We can we can think that it's a, an extra tax or whatever, but at the end of the day, uh, the jail is in bad shape. Uh, and another thing about this, and the most important thing, I believe, is the crisis center. And I think it's absolutely criminal that we don't have a place for our people to be able to go and uh, get the help that they're absolutely needed. We need a crisis center. We need a transitional center. Uh, once we get people the help that they need, we can break that cycle. And it's a vicious cycle that we have. 
that, that's out there right now. We, we take them to jail, we pick them up, they, they get out, we pick them up, we take them back to jail, they get out. We do that over and over again. And it's, it's time that we as a community say no more of taking them back. Let's get them in a, in a crisis center. Let's get them in a transitional center so that we can move forward. And it's Thank absolutely you. necessary. Mr. Carton. I had another one. <laughs> Blood disease, okay, it affects us all in this community that have been here and raised in it, and many people have been exposed to heavy metal toxic poisoning, okay? Yes, of course we need crisis centers in this community because that's what it does to people. It just affects their abilities in lots of ways, not just depression, but all kinds of other behaviors that this is all related to. At a workshop tonight, which to any of you had actually had come, including politicians, people of the city, League of Women Voters, anybody learning about things that affect people here. Now, I'm always an advocate of, I think, in for one to build jails. I'm in for one to support programs to deal with why we have problems, and not just dealing with a bunch of counselors either, but the causes of some of these things here. And they're complicated. They're not all Ludd's disease, because not everybody who's raised here or lives with uranium. Thank you. But for those who do. Any additional comments? Yeah. This I have one. Oh, Miss Hudson. Okay, um, this bond really is about taking people to jail. If you want to be real about it, that's what it is. Because if you're trying to build more bed spaces for the jail, then you're trying to fill the jail. But I think the emphasis should be on the crisis center because people have mental health problems here. And one way that that could be funded is to help them get on the feet and have them pay what's called subsistence to the program for their stay there. So that is one of the well, things that the city could think about doing to any help them get on their feet. Any other additional comments? Can I say something real quick? There is absolutely no one in the police department who wants to take people to jail. Uh, I don't think there's anybody in the city that wants to take people to jail. The crisis center is needed because there are absolutely people that are in the jail that shouldn't be there. But when we have no other resource, that's sometimes where the people end up. And it's for their safety and it's for our safety. So please support the bond. Uh, I understand that it's going to be a tax and I wish there was another way to pay for it. But we are spending twenty thousand dollars a month. Thank you. Any final? Yes. I, uh, oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Yeah, I do want to respond to that. It, this isn't about taking people to jail. It's about getting people the help that they need. We live in a community that reaches out when there's a, a an issue and there's a problem. But the issue and problem that we don't see that that happens to people because of a lack of funding on a state or federal level, we need to step up and help them. This is about the crisis center and about getting people the help that they need to. So absolutely, we will support the bond. Mr. Carter, any additional? Yeah, I, of course, as I mentioned, I'm completely supportive of any additional help for people. I actually have spent some time in the jail because I was abducted in this community because of my issues of sharing information about the problems here. So I've seen the inside. I know it needs some work. I also know they definitely need people to can counsel better and people on their team for it because, boy, that became a mess and a lot of taxpayers' money spent trying to silence people I associate with. So hopefully we can change a lot of that in the community. And I like Thank how the sheriff came out Thank for you very much. Ms. Hudson, Sinai bomb. this question will go first to Ms. Hudson. What is your plan to protect our air and water quality as as population and traffic increase in the Pocatello area. And so if you could address ideas such as promoting development of bike lanes and paths, improving public transportation, promoting the county's passing a groundwater protection ordinance, extension of sewer in Johnny Creek area. I like to address the uh, increasing our public transportation, the PTR is not very good, really. It's only, it runs every hour. You stand out there and wait, and it only does one full circle, so it misses a lot of areas that could be carrying people. So it's not utilized enough. And uh, talking to the bus drivers, they would like to see some routes increase. They would like to see uh, a bus run every 30 minutes. And that would re reduce toxins in our area if, if we can just get people to ride their bike and encourage them to take the bus system. But we would have to strengthen our bus system to do it because people have to get to work on time. And right now, the bus system only runs once in every hour. 
Thank you. Mr. Labumi? Well, on the PTR, uh, I think it's that uh, we overkill. Uh, every time I take a look at the PTR path need by, I see one or two people in the, on the bus. I never see more than uh, five or six at all. We have to study what the route we're gonna take and then see, uh, you know, to be benefit. It's not just, uh, you know, running a regular route and then look at this way. I never see anybody, anybody here, if you see the bus running around with 10 or more people, I don't think so. Uh, normally, the, the two or three the most. So we should to have a study on the route and see what the people want to go. Thank you. Ms. Bartlett? I do think we need our buses. Um, we've actually pulled back on some of the stops. We need to put those back and maybe even have some more. Um, bike lanes are nice, but we have really bad winters here. I mean, if we can get people to ride them in the summer, that'll be great. But unfortunately, we need our cars and our trucks. Uh, because we have bad winners. Uh, as far as the environment and the air quality, I will do everything in my power to make sure that we protect that. Um, thank you. Thank you. Mayor Blum. Thank you. First of all, I want to just mention the PRT system is an incredible system that we have, and they do a great job uh, with the with the money that's allocated to them. And so I appreciate their work and the things that they do. One thing that we are doing with this expansion in the North Gate, we're looking at high-tech, clean energy, high-paying jobs. We're talking about a community that has a lot of biking lanes and walking lanes where you work, <coughs> bike, play, and live all in the same area there. And so we're, we are addressing that as we, as we move forward with that. Our water, we continue to monitor the, monitor the water and we continue to make sure that it is clean. And we do have extremely clean water in our community. Our water department does a great job in making sure that happens. They do the studies, they, uh, every day they're doing tests on every well we've got out there to make sure we don't have a problem. He also mentioned the Johnny Crick area. Johnny Crick is something that's gonna cost millions and millions of dollars, but at some point we need to. Thank you, Mr. Kirk. I, I got Mr. 30 Kirk. more seconds, so I'm going to hit it. <laughs> Mr. Carter? <laughs> anyway, uh, yeah, of course we need transportation. I actually like the fact that we inter we connect beyond Pocatello with that system uh, for those who do need to connect in east to southeastern Idaho. I think that is something I would even utilize because I, I ride a bike mainly usually. Uh, it depends if I'm in a rush or not, then I use a motor-assisted bicycle. But um, sometimes, you know, I, I'd like to go farther in Pocatello. You know, I'd like to help people where people want my help in other communities but I say as far as I go I can only pedal so far so no nope, I won't be running for state or federal senate because it's just too much riding for me so but basically yeah the supportive of the buses yeah we need to work on it always efficiency and cleanliness and air quality is real important because every summer we got a real air problem issue here I think so thank you a lot of questions to answer in a short amount of time. Bike pass, the city has a master transportation plan that involves bike pass. We're not doing a very good job of following our own master plan. Um, so that's something that we really need to look at. Groundwater, uh, one of the issues that we continue to have with groundwater is leakage from septic tanks. Uh, the city just approved a gigantic septic tank out of the BLM firefighter hotshot building. Uh, I wouldn't have done that. Um, we have to deal with the septic tank leaking the nitrates into our wells. Uh, if we don't take care of that soon, we're going to have to treat every gallon of water that gets pumped through these places. And it's better now to put the money into the sewer system to pull it off the hill rather than it is to try and treat water for the rest of our lives here. Uh, unfortunately, yes, it's a lot of money. We're going to have to take care of it. Transportation, uh, I would definitely look at changing routes. We, we need to shorten the routes and put more routes out. Uh, and that will help in both of those issues. And on the water, our water department does do a great job. The only issue is we do have some wells that we've had to shut down because of nitrates. Thank you. Any additional? We'll move then. Oh, yes. I was oh, going to finish. Yes. <laughs> I recall. My Johnny Crick, we have been working uh, to try to find some federal money because we anticipate that project costing around 10 to $15 million to be able to put uh, sewer up through the Johnny Crick area. And so uh, we've been working on that. There are no more f uh, federal um, 
what are they called, the, where they just say, that's it. The Fed, the, there's no more federal money available, so we're looking for the grants to be able to make that happen. And so with that, we are doing, doing uh, and we've been working that direction. Thank you. This will go first to Mr. Labumi. Did you care to? I'd like to uh, address a, about, a little bit about the uh, water system. Sure. Yeah, I did too. Okay. Uh, the mayor says, uh, you know, we're going to expand up to the hill there. I live on that side of the hill also. But you have to take a look at one thing. If we have 10,000 people come in, I hope they don't come in the same time. <laughs> how are we going uh, to take care of all of those uh, fire station, police, and everything, you know? We should to take a look at that, you know? Are we prepared for it? Thank you. Ms. Hudson, right. did you say? Yes, and I want to say, um, I keep hearing that, it says we are addressing the problem, we are addressing the problem, but you don't, uh, cannot address a problem without involving the community. As elected officials, our job is to be the voice of the people. We can't address the problems without the community involvement. Thank you, Ms. Bartlett. Mr. Carter? Yeah. Are, go ahead. Yeah, just, I, we already had Mr. Blatt. Just want, just I just have a concern areas. because I didn't know the water department actually cleaned water. They test it. They do those mm -hmm. kinds of things. If it needs cleaning, we got a problem. Actually, a lot of our water is clean when it goes in, and Beaver help on that, and the infiltration from its watershed, and that's very important to protect. But once it gets down here, then we have the problems to it, and septic tanks is but one of them. But actually, the amount of water that comes into our system is another one, and that's limited. Nobody's mentioned the word sustainability, Thank quality you. of life here. Mr. Horst, did you have a final comment on this? No, this will go first to Mr. Labumi. If elected mayor, what would your top three economic priorities be? First of all, uh, I'm a project engineer. I know several uh, you know, company which is that I've been talking to. Uh, I can bring the, some uh, business, like an engineering firm or manufacturer, uh, which is it's not a, you know, fat food system. I have a plan, you know, it's not as good as the, uh, uh, up the hill, but uh, we should, we should to support local people, small business. Uh, you know, it seems to be the small business in Pocatel here never gets enough support. Everything you see, everybody know, uh, don't forget one thing, the business in Pocatello here, you know, support uh, the local, I mean, uh, support the city. I believe, you know, we should to support more small business in Pocatello. Thank you. Ms. Bartlett? My three economic priorities are, one is a funding for city departments. We need to bring the services back up, especially if all of these people are coming. We need to bring them all back up, not even just what they used to be, but better than that. Um, job diversity. I want to see different kinds of jobs, not just IT jobs, but all kinds of jobs here. Um, and then workforce retention. We need to start working on keeping people here and not having them leave. The reason the jobs aren't coming is because they say they're not ready. So we need to get them ready. Thank you. So first of all, the, my top three things. Number one, we're going to continue to do what we've been doing the last eight years, and that's bringing businesses to Pocatello. We're going to continue to in, increase the employment. Over the last eight years, we have a net gain of 2,400 jobs. Those jobs are paying more money. People are being uh, have better insurance than we've had in the past, and they're going to continue to do that. We have, uh, as, as uh, you look at the large businesses, large businesses feed on the small business. And they support them, they work with them, and they continue to, to support them, and we'll continue to do that. We had a list of uh, a couple of the large businesses on semiconductors, Amy's Kitchen, uh, Great Western Malting, and those companies have, a number, have about seven or 800 small businesses in Pocatello that they work directly with to make sure that those businesses continue to. And then education. We've started a program called Your Fit, and that is a program that will teach high school students students, so they will be prepared to enter the workforce. Thank you. Mr. Carta. 
Well, three of them, huh? What? We need to fix ISU. I think that's pretty apparent to a lot of people, and it's gotten a lot of publicity about it. And like I said, leadership, something that ISU can bank on, really, totally bank on, because there's just all kinds of directions they can do when it deals with cleanup. And do we have places to clean up? Sure. There's an example of right next to the children's clinic here, and right next to them, tons of uranium materials, and right next to Franklin Junior High School, and there's some on Franklin Junior High School. You know, but who wants to come here? Just because you keep taking the signs down doesn't mean people ain't gonna wanna come, you know, wanna come here. You gotta clean up. Cut her up, just does it work for people. Northern Idaho is known for its cleanup. It still ain't cleaned up after 30 years, but it's cleaning it up. We've never been began here. Just cover up, cover up, cover up. Contaminating our children at schools. I'm here to save lives, and most of you who know anything about me, even Brian when he first met Thank me, you. is here to save lives. Thank you. Mr. Horst? Uh, economic things would be reducing the levy rate, number one priority. Levy rate will bring in the people who want to live here, and it will bring in the businesses if they can be competitive because of the levy rate. Uh, streamlining the city. During one of the things that, uh, the last recession that we had, the city actually increased its staff rather than decreased its staff. Uh, one of the things that we need to work on, it is our greatest number one general fund expense, is payroll and expense. Uh, we have to reduce our staffing. We have to look at what we actually want to serve from the county or from the city and what you as the taxpayers are willing to pay for. Uh, it comes down to what you guys are willing to pay for and we as the mayor, city council need to make that happen for you. That's our job. Uh, last thing that I would bring up would be bringing businesses in. Again, you reduce the levy rate, you reduce the overall expenses and businesses will want to come here. Uh, it's difficult to recruit someone when you're the highest tax rate in the state. Thank you. Ms. Hudson? Yes. Um, leveling taxes is, is very important because businesses will not come here if they cannot afford to come. They just won't. And then one thing I would do is um, try to compel the governor to get us out of min, um, federal minimum wage, which is seven twenty-five an hour. Try to work with the governor because uh, people can't survive. It takes $12 an hour to survive in Pocatello with food, cold, and shelter. Can't keep hiding from it. That's the reality. Um, and it's just support small businesses. Get, have them give them some grant money, get them on their feet, let them run their businesses, even if they're in Old Town or anywhere they're at in Pocatello. We need to build Pocatello up and quit, because um, Chepik is exploding. And there's, there's some, I don't know why, but they're exploding and we're not. So there's got to be a reason why businesses will go to Chubbuck and not come here. There's just got to be, and I'm not really sure right now what that is. But we'll be looking into it. Any additional comments, Mr. Levine? Well, I have the last comment on this thing here because I'm a businessman. The thing is, it's a level of tax that we should to exempt for the big business or small business. And we should to help them, you know, to do whatever it is, especially when you start building something, we have to take a look at, uh, you know, the planning uh, department and uh, uh, building, uh, building inspector and all of those things there. It's very difficult to do anything in Pocatello because it happened to me, I have to delay for a year before I can get my business going up. I've been losing lots of money after that. So you, you should to, you know, you have to know how difficult it is to deal with the city of Pocatello because they think they are the boss. They forgot whatever, who pay for their wages. Thank, thank you. Ms. Bartlett? Well, I appreciate the businesses that are here. We just don't have enough good businesses that pay, pay a living wage. We have people that are just working too many jobs. We have 300 homeless children in District 25. We shouldn't even have one. I mean, that's, I, I, I hate that we have that. Um, as far as getting kids ready for uh, school, uh, we need to start earlier than high school. We've been trying to get them ready um, since I was teaching. 
and as far as um, cutting services, we just can't cut services. They already are. Thank you. Any additional comment? Uh, absolutely. I want to clarify a few things. Number one, we the city of Pocatello does not have the highest levy rate in the state of Idaho. We are not the highest paid tax, tax people. And I want to remind people that we are one of, the city of Pocatello is one of seven entities that are involved in that levy rate. So the city can drop the taxes to zero and that levy rate can still go up. So if we're looking at a levy rate, we're looking at the wrong thing. We need to start looking at what it costs to do business and what it takes to do that. When it comes to good businesses coming in town, we have absolutely recruited a number of... Thank you. Mr. Carter? <laughs> We just had a meeting at City Hall here about um, the junior high over there on this side of town. I think I remember something about 75% of them are in the lunch program, you know, on the free lunch program. I mean, and it's all over town. I visit every place that gives the free lunches in this community and talk to people all over this region here. Yeah, they didn't even want to let people know how many people are on the you know, poverty levels in, in this community and going to these schools. Now, you know, you can say, well, that dad is wrong and only this dad is right, but hey, these are real people out there and their kids are hurting and so are our schools. Mr. Horst, additional? Uh, the only thing I can say is I understand the levy rate. I understand that we're not the only entity that taxes. I also see on the street every single day people struggling. So it doesn't matter if your statistics say that we're doing great. When you go out on the street, you see the people that aren't doing well. And that is widespread throughout the city. We need to make that change. Any final comment? Yeah, you don't only have to go out on the street to see them. You can go over to the Salvation Army who's increasing the number of homeless people they're serving each week. You can go there, park, watch, and look. Thank you. This question will go first to Ms. Bartlett. What opportunities do the results of the recent Pocatello Police Union survey present? I looked at the survey. Now, as an executive director, I agree with the chief. It did not give enough information. Yes, people are, are unhappy. I volunteered over there. I know that. Um, it's a, this police department is a different type than any other departments. It's like the military. And I, there's just a way that you do things. There's a hierarchy there. Now, I wish that you could go and talk to them. I worked in a place where it was like that, and you couldn't talk to uh, your supervisor because you were afraid of, of not moving up. But one thing I would say to the employees is, you need to look at what makes it positive for you. How do you turn that around to make it positive for yourself? And then you need to, have a plan. So when you go to the chief and you tell him um, what you have planned, what will work for you. Um, if you don't have a plan, then tell him that. But I completely understand both sides of it. Thank you. Mayor Blood? The police survey, it's an interesting one there. We talked a little bit about good leadership. We have a police union president that has put out a survey for three years in a row now. Maybe maybe it was only two years, but he has yet to help fix the problem. In fact, we have yet to have anything and know what the real problem is. As a chief will sit down with different police officers, they ask him and they're okay. They don't have problems when he's talking to them. Uh, when I when I look at the the survey, the the questions are written to get a negative response instead of find out what the real issues are. I'm not going to say we don't have issues at all, but if we want to fix the problems, we really truly need to know what those problems are so we can fix them. And if uh, if anybody knows what those are, let us know what they are so that we can get it done. And, and it can it can happen at that point. But until we know what the problems are, it's tough to fix what you don't know is out there. Thank you. Mr. Karkton? Well, I know what some of them are because it's, the buck stops where? At the top. Uh, most of the people I've met in the Pocatello Police Department, the patrol level, or a lot of people here are great people, treating me with respect, treating me, you know, great. But, you know, like when I was uh, here with the Human Relations Committee and they got raided, you know, because I was in the building, yeah, there were six police officers in there, and all of them are great. But then the sergeant, as you go up the ladder there, had to call Brian up. What are we going to do? Do we arrest Lorax? You can't arrest Lorax. Lorax wasn't here. He was invited here by the head person of the Human Relations Committee. So, you know, what did they do? They're in a conundrum. Can't arrest me. you got to arrest her. Okay? But the thing is, it comes from the 
top down, and that's been our problem. There's no going up the ladder unless you're going to kiss butt to those above you. And that I've experienced, never mind a survey, I have some personal experience here. Thank you. Mr. Horst? I wrote that survey. Uh, I'm involved in that survey. I also spent two and a half hours in the mayor's office after the first survey trying to come to an agreement on how we could go forward with these advances. The next day in the paper, we were slammed as a union for trying to come to him. Uh, this is the problem that we have. This is not a problem just in the police department. I know that this goes on in other departments. I'm not gonna name them out. We have tried everything we could to get along, play nice, and to work. Your officers will never, ever stand down. Thank you. Ms. Hudson? It, this is really an unfair question to me because I didn't get to read the survey. I don't know what the survey said. And so I only get to read and be opinionated from what the paper said about it, which says our police officers are very unhappy. And they don't really feel like they can go to their bosses. So somehow that has to be fixed because they're not gonna be able to do their job properly if they don't feel like they're being respected. Thank you, Mr. Labumi. Well, I live in here for a long time. Don't like to mention it again. You know, I never see any officers suing the, uh, you know, police police department at City of Pocatello here. This is the first time I ever heard. I don't know uh, what is going on inside because I'm not insider. The thing is, is uh, I sell the gun, sell a gun to the officer to graduate from uh, academy here in Pocatello. It's a the city had been give them uh, uh, the money to go to school, you know, uh, and then come back, they're supposed to work several amount of year. And then when I say, how come you not work for Pocatel PD anymore? They say, well, I don't like them, they didn't treat me right. So I went to somewhere else. Some of them went to shop big at lower pay, and some of them went to another, you know, you know county like a Blackfoot. We have to fix it. Thank you. Ms. Bartlett, an additional comment? Ms. Mayor Blood? I just think that it's important to know our police department's a great department. They do an incredible job and they do their job very well. They have the tools, the cars, the training that is needed to do their job. When they have an issue, they have a chain of command to follow. That chain of command, it needs to continue to work the way it is supposed to up the ladder and it will work the way it's supposed to back down the ladder. And uh, I just want the officers to know I, I think they do a great job. And in fact, I'd stand behind everybody in our police department uh, 100% as we go through the country. Thank you. Mr. Carta? Well, I just wish Brian would let the hazmat people use the Geiger counters. That's, <laughs> that's my issue. <laughs> I thought that was fire. Any additional comment? I have Mr. Horst? You can't buy officers' loyalty. They're going to work. They're going to do their job because they serve their community. Um, every, everything else that gets said here uh, in regards to that, I'm trying to, I'm trying to stay on a nice path. Okay? I could go on and on. Um, we are being sued by an employee here at the city for a million dollars. Uh, and I would strongly suggest people who want to know what's going on within the police department, read that. Any additional comments? Yes? Well, I just want to um, bring out to the community that if the union went to the city government and they got into the paper that that was a big breach of confidentiality. Thank you. Mr. Lumi, any additional? And so uh, this will go, oh, Ms. Bartlett. I think it's me. I'm so sorry. I uh, give me one moment here. Yeah, Ms. Bart, I'm sorry. Bye. I'm sorry. So we are done with the additional comments. You started, right? And you passed on your additional. For, uh, to Mayor Blad, please give us your stand on the proposed sign ordinance changes, specifically regarding billboards. You know, billboards are an interesting thing, and. The sign ordinance and the changes there are very, very, it's, it's a complex issue there. We have a number of billboards in our community and there's no reason for us to tear all those billboards down. Right now, as, as they are up, that will just hurt uh, business and we've got a good, business, good small businesses are going right now. If we have an ordinance, we need to follow that ordinance is what I, uh, is, as far as I'm concerned, follow it. 
uh, make sure that we're doing the things the right way right now and if we're going to change it we'll have those discussions our city staff has been working very hard on that they had a meeting this the other day with uh, the sign owners the people that own the signs and there are some things that can happen on both sides of that and we recognize that and i anticipate that happening as we move forward with with it but i'm not in favor right now of tearing all the signs down we need to be able to keep them up where people have spent the money now and and they've they've got the investment made we need to recognize that and support that thank you mr Carpton. They keep taking these signs down, I'll tell you that one. They just keep taking them down. Where I was interviewed, of course, you know, where the place that's got no trespassing sign, that's a plus, you know, and but it's a super fun site and there it is. But they, you know, they take these signs down all the time. And anywhere else they've been in the town, including employees of the city, they were told to take them down. So anyways, yeah, signs, they are for a purpose when we should use them, you know, within reason. Because that's what we do as a business. We want to let people know. In this case, we want to protect people. We want parents to know. We want children to know. We want anybody to know until they fix the problem, which would be just make things better. The same things with signs. You know, there is, it's evolving art, uh, looking at how to reach people without being too obtrusive. But the same, the thing is, it's got purpose. I mean, we're not going to go away overnight. We can, we can create a community that doesn't have any signs at all. Um, but that's going to be a little while down the road for now because the internet's not that broadened yet. It's probably got enough signs on that. Mr. Horst? Uh, one of the things I agree with the mayor on this one, uh, the signs shouldn't come down. You look at all the signs that come up through the city, they're all different sizes, some are electronic, some aren't. Our ordinance has fallen behind. We haven't done a very good job of keeping up with it. Uh, once you make an ordinance though, quit giving the exceptions. The exceptions are what caused the problems. That's what caused the problem this time, is more people coming in and asking for exceptions to the ordinance. If we would follow the rules, and change them as we needed to for ne new technology, we shouldn't have these issues. Uh, and that's as simple as I think it can be. Thank you. Ms. Hudson? Well, city ordinances are, pl are put in place so that people will know what they can and can't ask for. And billboards are important because they do advertise, and I, I think they need to stay up because there's not that many here. Thank you. Mr. Lindley? Well, I agree with the mayor, but the thing is we have to take a look at the, the side. We shouldn't ban all the side because they have a three small business in Pocatel here. If they ban, you're going to lose some employee and all of those things there. We have to take a look, you know, where the side put it on, where the owner's going to say, you know. Uh, the thing is, again, uh, if you put a side, electronic side, in conjunction with the resident, it's no, no. In certain area, you know, like a Yellowstone or some another area in, around town, which is, uh, we should to have some exception. Even uh, in downtown, in old town Pocatello, they don't want anything new in there, but we should to look at the exception. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Ms. Bartlett? I do believe that the ordinance should be followed. Uh, if you want to change the ordinance, that's fine. But I think you should let the businesses that have those signs up leave them there. Because if that's not fair. You're, they've already paid to put them up. Plus, uh, it's going to cost money for them to take them down, too. Any additional comments, Mayor Black? Mr. Carta? Mr. Horst? Ms. Hudson? Mr. Lewinley? We will then direct this next question first to Mr. Kurta. What do you see as necessary that the city do to ensure the best outcomes for the gateway project? Gateways, you know, when we we're going to do the connector, people talked about, oh, all the jobs are going to move over there. So it affects old town, fix mall, fix the whatever. Of course, when we put the exchange there and everything moved to Chubbuck, well, it moved to the interstate is what it did. And that's the mentality people have. Things will move to an interstate. They want a, that connection. Like people are going to come up in Salt Lake just to shop here in Pocatello. So they can get right off, shop, and go on their way. Uh, but the reality is, what are we doing for our people here? And can we do it? I talked about sustainability, talked about the realities of issues. Some of these places, they've been dusted with uranium materials for years. There's a reason why people didn't live there and why it was cheap to actually get the land. Because, yeah, put an RIID on it, radioactive isotope identifier, and you'll see. 
So, you know, we've got a lot of problems here. Again, cleanup is jobs. Lots of jobs. Lots of research. Lots of jobs. Every level. Everybody, every business in this community would be involved in cleanup in Thank for you. a long time. Thank you. Mr. Horst? I think one of the things that we need to do is be more transparent about what's going on up there. I think there's a lot of questions and speculation as to what's happening, and not very much information is available. Um, one of the problems that you run into then is the people that are paying for that stuff to go in are doing it blindly. They're following just whatever whim is chosen by the council. Um, and I have a problem with that. We need to be transparent. If it's something that the city wants, let's be open and honest to them. And if that's what they want, then I'm all for doing it. But until we're transparent and people know what's actually going to go out there, I struggle trying to support something like that. Thank you. Ms. Hudson? Well, looking at that gateway project, I don't believe the community really knows anything too much about it except for the city council. And that's really because who are the contractors? Who is really getting paid from that? Who is building it? Is it people in our community? See, those kind of things need to be kept in our community to provide jobs here, not go somewhere else. And really only a small portion of Pocatello is in that. A, part, a small part of Pocatello Highway is in it. But we're all giving a lot of money to it. So I think the only way it can be successful now is you have to have, be transparent and involve the community in the decisions, in the decision-making processes of where we go from, because I think the city's obligated to it now. Thank you. Mr. Lerman? Well, uh, I didn't know much about the Gateway Project, but I've been reading a little bit about that. You know, I agree with Chad. You know, we should to uh, make a decision uh, not uh, in open, not just that, uh, you know, city council and the mayor accept it. That's all I have to say. You should to have with a public hearing or we have it open. Thank you. Ms. Bartlett? I do think it needs to be more transparent what's going on with that. Um, I talk to a lot of people and they're like, yeah, this is great. I want it to grow really fast. We need to make sure it doesn't grow too fast because we don't have another school. Our schools are crowded already. So are we gonna have another bond for a school? Um, our city resources, they're, they're not up to par yet for that many people coming. So I want it to be a responsible growth. I don't want to see everybody moving over just to that area like they did with Hurley Drive. People are just moving off of Yellowstone and going to that area. Um, so I want to see responsible growth with that. Thank you. Mayor Blatt? So the Net Northgate project is, a, is an incredible project. And if you're interested in all the transparency and you want to know all, everything about it, Bannock Development Corporation has a symposium that's coming up that they're going to be t talking about this with the developer and with ITV uh, so that, that you'll know everything you might want to know about it. It'll be available coming up at the end of the month. So uh, the project is great. We've got a great developer that's working with us when we start talking about roads, police, fire, schools. They're looking for ways and they're finding ways that they can help fund that and that they will fund that as we move forward so that the city isn't buried and the tax base and the, the money isn't available for us. They're going to help provide that money and make sure that we can provide the services that are needed when it comes to streets, water, uh, sewer, police, fire, any of the schools and different parks and things like that. This developer is one that really thinks outside the box and he's they're really truly a community partner. It's going to be a great project for us. Thank you. Mr. Kirkland. Well, there's another a little visual for you. Can't see it too well, but if you came to the workshop, you would have been able to. That's a picture of a study done here by EG&G, used to be the contractors for INL for many years. This is Pocatello Chubbuck. And if you're going to take a look at it closer or take one of the things and look at it yourself, yeah, they, one thing these developers ain't got is this which has been available for people for a long time. And this is where all the uranium materials are. This is where the contamination sites are. <coughs> Talk about schools. We don't have enough schools that are clean enough in this thank community for them. Thank you. I think our timer has the wrong card up. Sorry. Oh. <laughs> We're on remodel. So, so moving, so moving well, uh, to additional? Yeah, comments? I just have one quick comment on the, the Northgate project. Ultimately, the I think, the mayor just said it. We have a coming up meeting. Uh, I think one of the things that most people probably in this room don't understand is the city through the PDA and through our funds have already donated or have already allocated about $2.8 million of our money to that project. Um, 
I don't know that that's right for the public to come into this later on knowing, and I worry that this may be another Hoku incident. Uh, we've put a lot of money into this project, and I, I hope it goes through. I honestly do. I just wish it was more transparent and the people had the knowledge before it all, all the money got spent. Thank you, Ms. Hudson. Any additional comments? Yeah, I do. Um, the community should have been informed at the beginning of the project, not when the developers are available to start telling you what they want you to know, which is at the end of the month when they already kicked it off at the beginning of this month. So I just don't see where that's helpful to the community when the money has already been spent. And most people in the community don't even know where the money is going, but they're paying for it. Any additional comments? Mr. Laboon, Ms. Bartlett? Um, another thing I want to make sure of is that uh, we get our workforce trained for that. Uh, we don't want to see people transferring in and having those high paying jobs and having the people that live here already just working the retail and the fast food around it. Any additional comments, Mary Black? I think it's great. <laughs> this has been the worst kept secret in the city of Pocatello. If you don't know about it and you don't know where the money's coming from and you don't know where the money's gone, it's because you haven't been paying attention. It, quite frankly, it's been available. Wait, please. It, 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 your it, 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 has been, it has been out there for eight solid years <laughs> is what it's been out there for. And so so the 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 idea that we, this has been done in, in a closet behind closed doors is just not true. There are some confidentiality issues that you have to follow and you have to continue to follow and, and that's what we have done. Thank you. This question will go first to Mr. Horst. How do you feel about property owners' land use rights? I believe that there's a set standard that we have in the city. Uh, you're zoned certain areas and you have to choose where you live. Um, and I think you should be held to those zoning regulations and zoning ordinances in the place that you choose to live. Um, I don't think that we should be giving out a bunch of exceptions uh, for residential areas. We want to live in residential areas that are quiet and that don't have commercial business fronts or light commercial or the noise pollution coming across the street. Uh, so I think part of the issue, again, it goes back to the sign thing. We have an ordinance. Let's follow it. Let's stop with the exceptions. Thank you, Ms. Hudson. Zoning and regulations are important for a city to have, and the ones that we have in place for have been in long, have been here for years. So your residential is your zone residential, your business residential is zone that for a purpose. So we need to keep that clear boundaries on there and not allow people to come in and get conditional use permits in where places that they should not be. And then we can keep everything in zoning straight straighten out. Thank you. Mr. Levin. Well, uh, I own the business of uh, Jefferson, which is, uh, uh, is uh, used to be Alameda. Uh, that used to be, uh, you know, not too many regulations in the past. So I got the grandfather law on those. So uh, probably you guys know I used to have a computer store called Computer Hut, which is a uh, uh, successful uh, business until I got disabled. Now, you know, that thing there, before we can do anything, we have to get approved from the city, but it's not 100%. I believe in the zoning, I believe in the uh, city ordinance, we should to follow. Thank you. Ms. Bartlett? I do believe that if you're a landowner and you choose to live in a part of the city that is zoned a certain way, that you should follow the zoning ordinance. Thank you. Private property rights are pretty important to everybody in the state of Idaho. We we are very we we focus on them and we want to keep our private property rights and we want those rights. Now there's also zoning issues that we have in the city and and the zoning uh, when you buy some property you do have some due diligence so you need to find out what zone that is in so that you can uh, do start a business there, live there, uh, whatever it takes, whatever you're looking for to, to be able to, to do with those. Uh, there is one issue, though, that uh, I think that I would fight to protect private property 
property rights with the exception to when it starts in, in, interfering with your neighbor, that's when you've now started to uh, cross the line there. We live in a world that we need to start treating people the way people act like people are people and realize that our neighbors are right there. We need to live together and we need to coexist. And when, uh, when we do that, things are going to be okay. Thank you. Ms. Carter? <coughs> well, all I want to say on this is every time I speak at a hearing here and I address the zones of uranium contamination, it's never, ever addressed. It's all public record, or it's supposed to be, because I testify. But it's never addressed. It's completely ignored. And you wonder why people are angry in the city who find out their properties are contaminated. You know, especially people ain't from here. And a lot of the people who left. Yeah, we continue those kinds of pro processes. Yeah, the zoning, yeah, we have zone one, two, and three. Ground zero zone one, ground zero zone two, which you're in right here, and the ground zero zone three over by the university. And if you don't know what things look like, they got lots of maps for you to see where it is, and more and more is going to go up in the next two years because we're here to clean up this valley and to save lives and save our children. No matter what your little petty thing is you. about zoning. And any additional comments? We'll start first with Mr. Horst. Ms. Hudson? Yes, I'd like to um, say we, what is interfering with your neighbor when it comes to zoning when a highway is being built and some businesses that I was told were taken out, three of them. What about that? Thank you. Mr. Lovell. Ms. Bartlett? Yeah. Mayor Blatt? No. And Mr. Um, okay, this appears to be the last question for the evening. We are going through to 8.40 p.m. Um, to make up for the late start. And um, that will give our candidates a minute each to make final comments. Um, so with this question, jobs and clean energy are booming across the nation. And this will go first to Ms. Hudson. How do you see Pocatello taking advantage of the situation? And what role can the city play in promoting a clean energy economy? Guys, we already addressed that kind of with the busing system, adding more <coughs> buses and more routes to make more cleaner, efficient air. Well, I'm trying to think of what would be the best way for us to, for me to answer that question, because um, as a social worker, I look at people's, their needs and food, clothing and shelter needs and then looking at the quality of air because if you don't have air, good quality of air, you're not going to survive. So we do need to see about what's going in and work with more of the EPA. Make sure that the, we are following the regulations and guidelines that are set forth by the government. Just making sure that we are following those guidelines. Thank you. Mr. Lovell. Would you repeat the yes. uh, question, please? Sure. <laughs> I will. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, oh, my gosh. I lost it. Yes, I shall. However, uh, here it is. Jobs in clean energy are booming across the nation. How do you see Pocatello taking advantage of this situation? And what role can the city play in promoting a clean energy economy? Well, the first thing we have to take a look at uh, how many people uh, move in Pocatello. And then uh, the whole country here, we have an EPA, we have, a, you know, OSHA and everything on it, you know. So we have to follow the rule and regulation. I work at the INL for many years. Before we can do anything, we have to, first thing we have to do is, uh, you know, environment uh, study. Any project we do, uh, we, every project we have been done, we have to follow all of those rules. I think we should to do the same thing. We support it and we like to see the city and the country grow. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Bartlett? Well, it sounds like at the Northgate project that we may have some jobs that address clean air. So that'd be great. I absolutely support having those jobs here. and. Uh, I think it's a good thing. I, I like to see that, um, and we need to follow the guidelines. And I think we could be really innovative in, with that if the Northgate project is going to be something involved with that. 
Thank you. Mayor Blatt? Companies and businesses all around the world right now are trying to reduce their carbon footprint and they're doing an incredible job doing so. As I look at what Pocatello has done in the past, it's, it's, in, it's awesome. Great Western Malting, very low emissions are, are emitted with that. Uh, Amy's Kitchen, the same way. Uh, Western States Caterpillar, believe it or not, is uh, fairly low emissions when it comes to their large equipment. They've been working tirelessly to reduce those emissions. The FBI expansion in Pocatello was incredible for us. We have 350 high paying jobs that are coming, they just announced. They're still in the process of filling another 350 that they had announced a year or two ago as well. Those are, those are very low. Buchanan Edwards is another company coming into town that is, uh, I mean, it's a financial uh, advisory company that is working with the FBI. They're hiring 50 or 60 people and, and there's no emissions there. So we are we are doing our job as a city to make sure that happens. Thank you. Mr. Karkta? Well, I'm glad the FBI ain't making cyanide bombs, at least uh, I haven't heard yet. <laughs> uh, but we still got that problem here, don't we? Um, clean energy? I, I deal with people who are off the grid. That's a problem for some people and some governments because, yeah, going off the grid is the way I work with islands. You know, hey, be independent. Don't be dependent on water and power and your oils and things like that. And so, what can we do here? Well, we got to deal with that. But again, we got energy here, tons of it. That's what I said at a hearing one time. Just collect it and let's get our reap our money from the uranium materials. Let them make the, that dirty stuff elsewhere and clean up the community. Again, if there's any ethical people in this town left which I believe there are, because I work with a lot of them, but it's an ethical issue, you know, until you deal with your ethics of saving children, cleaning up this community, waking up every morning with that cup of coffee, that first cup, clean up Pocatello. You've got a long ways to go, and it ain't going away for thousands of years. Thank you. Mr. Horst? Clean energy jobs in pretty much anywhere are solar and wind are the vast majority of the two big ones. Uh, we have both of those here, a lot of wind and a lot of sun. Uh, I would totally support clean energy, solar panels, if we can set those up. Um, I think we've missed out greatly on the wind tower, wind turbines out here. Uh, we have a great facility at the NLP complex where we could have been building those towers instead of shipping those in from other places, employing welders, employing fitters, employing the people that are gonna build those rather than just shipping them in from somewhere else. Uh, I think we've missed out a little bit on that. I think we had something we can get behind to support that would bring great jobs in here. Clean energy, I think the only thing that we can do in this town, we're lucky not to have coal fire plants. Uh, but we do have a lot of wood burning homes, wood burning stoves and stuff like that. Uh, if we can convert a lot of those to natural gas or to back to electricity, I think we'll, we'll clean our air a little more than we, we do currently. Thank you. Any additional comments from Ms. Hudson? Yeah, um, it was mentioned about the, all these jobs that are coming here or are here about the expansions of them. But what I'm not hearing is how are these jobs putting people in Pocatello, which they're supposed to represent to work. What I understand is there's not written in any of these policies that you employ so many people who are here. So when we got we're talking about, we were trying to talk about air quality, it was brought up about all these different plants. So it was the version of the Thank actual you. question. Mr. Levin, well, uh, I support the clean energy, the wind turbine, uh, wind turbine, and uh, uh, solar energy. Uh, I like to support that, and we should to look into it. How we can build? Uh, you know, I don't want to be like a whole group, bring something <coughs> over, and uh, you know, uh, get to build that solar energy, and then we feel we have to pay for it. We should to look at the, you know, any home portal. We should give <coughs> them an incentive. Thank you. Any additional comments, Ms. Bartlett, and Mayor Vlad, Mr. Carter? Yes. Four words, Google them. Living with uranium, Pocatello, click images. The world knows. They want to know why you're doing these things here. And I'm gonna help them because I, I love making movies. So, hey, if I interview you, tell me your opinion about it because there's a lot of people want to know how can you allow children to go to schools here with the uranium contamination and other things here. So, hey, they're looking for me with my camera and others. Thank you. Mr. Horst, any final comment on that question? Then our first concluding remarks will come from, from Mr. Laubun. 
Well, uh, the last time Pocatel residents went out to vote for the mayor, only 17% of registered voters cast the ballot. This time here, I would like to encourage all the registered voters or non-registered voters to register it. Get out on November 7th and vote for the person who feel is the most qualified leadership and regardless of that race, religion, or gender. Thank you for all of you. Thank you. Ms. Hartlett. Oh, you're going down this way. That's right, I too. <laughs> okay. Um, well, I really care about my community. That's why I'm running for mayor. Uh, I want to see it as an innovative place. I want to make sure that the people who live here are educated to take on those really good jobs. I want us to have good jobs. And I want us to make sure that our town grows in all areas. And I think that I could be, a, where I work with corporations and federal government already, I think I can bring in some of those things. I think I can be, have the potential to be a strong voice for our community. And I thank you for your consideration and I thank you for coming out tonight. Thank you, Mayor Blaine. First of all, thank you very much for the League of Women, Women Voters and for all of you, you that have tuned in and that have come to this debate. I really appreciate your time and effort. I would uh, just like to say, let's keep moving forward, Pocatello. Let's keep doing what we're doing right now. I would appreciate your vote uh, on November 7. I would appreciate you going out and supporting it. I want to thank the other candidates for running. It's not easy to sit up here and take these questions. We've got some uh, some good candidates. Get to know them and get to know what, what we've got out there. But uh, as we as I look at what we've been able to accomplish over the last eight years of my uh, being the mayor, it's incredible to see an unemployment rate that goes down from 10% down to 2.3%. It's incredible to see in the increase of wages. It's incredible to see the amount of millions and hundreds of millions of dollars that have been invested into our community. So thank you, and please uh, please vote for me. Please uh, look at the bond, get to know those things, and, and I would encourage people to support that as well. We desperately need some help for, for people there, so thank you. Thank you. Mr. Kirkland? Well, you know, me and Brian have been here together since I came here. Um, <laughs> I'm not going to say together. I'll argue that. You know, things exponentially change because I'm an educator. I'm a wide breadth educator in many areas. As I'm a scientist in many areas. You've never had a scientist, educator, community activist, entertainer, comedian, journalist, <laughs> reporter. Talk about openness. And you're running your city. Talk about open. Can't get any more open than that. Okay? And and ethics? <laughs> you know that's what I stand ground on. So we want to grow into a future worthy of people and worthy of our children and our future here. Then it's time you wake up. Don't be afraid of the shadows or your own shadows. Change like even when the councilman is here, you know, what can we do? We need to bite the bullet for a little. Thank hey, you, Mr. Mr. Horst. I'd like to tell everyone thank you for your support. Uh, I agree with Sam. Please come out and vote. Vote for the person that you think is most qualified. Um, ever since I was graduated high school, I served my country and served in my community, and I'll continue to do that. Um, I'm asking for your support so we can make these things better, um, and I appreciate everyone coming out. Please see me on Facebook if you have any questions, or check the city's website for all of our contact information. Thank you, and the final word tonight will be with Ms. Hudson. I want to thank you voters for coming out and hearing from each of us candidates. I just would like to add that it's important that when you go to vote that you think about the quality of life. Which candidate is going to support the quality of life for each individual in Pocatello who will vote the way the heartbeat of the city, who's not going to be voting and trying to and will want to be more transparent and working with the community. It's really important that people get out and vote. Your vote is important. I've heard people who haven't voted here ever, and they're older, and they have never even got registered. But your vote matters. Your vote counts. So get out and vote. Thank you. And a few concluding remarks. We want to thank everyone who's here participating, the candidates, 
and the audience. Um, this is a really important part of informing ourselves, and we encourage you to keep in mind the following deadlines. The last day to register to, or to pre-register to vote is October 13th, and in Idaho we also do have same-day registration, so you can register at the polls. Early walk-in voting is from 9 a.m. to 4.30 p.m. Mondays through Fridays, starting Tuesday the 10th of October through November 3rd, and that's a Friday, and that's in the Bannock County Courthouse, uh, next to the Bannock County Courthouse in what people refer to as the old jail at 141 North 6th Street. Um, on October 27th, the last day uh, is the deadline, the last day for application for mail-in absentee ballots. And we ask you all to please vote on Tuesday, November 7th from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. Bring a government-issued photo ID or you can request to sign a personal identification affidavit at the poll itself. To get involved in League of Women Voters, go to our Facebook page or there are our materials out on the table by the doors um, as you're leaving. We hope that this was helpful to you and we are very grateful for your participation.